Hello. And happy Earth Day 2020, everyone. Welcome to this carbon pricing lobby training to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. My name is Bobby Trice, and I'm the program assistant for Quaker Outreach here at the Friends Committee on National Legislation, or FCNL. FCNL is a nonpartisan Quaker lobby in the public interest. We advocate in Congress uh, to pass policies that reflect Quaker values, which include environmental stewardship. We seek that of God in each legislator, which is why our climate program is focusing on building bipartisan support for climate action in Congress. I will be the host for this event, and I am so excited to be here virtually to learn more about Earth Day, climate change, carbon pricing, and so much more. In this session, we'll be covering the significance of Earth Day, FCNL's climate program, and we'll conclude with a lobby training on carbon pricing. We'll start with 15 minutes of discussion between FCNL's Amelia Keegan and Alicia Cannon. Following the discussion, Alicia will facilitate a lobby training for y'all. In the final 10 minutes, we will open it up to the audience for questions and further discussion. If you have any questions or reflections to share during the event, please use the chat function, which you can find at the bottom of your screen on most devices. Um, without further ado, let's get started. Uh, first, I want to introduce Amelia Keegan. Uh, Amelia is the Legislative Director for the Domestic Policy and leads the Economic Justice Portfolio. Next, we have Alicia Cannon, the Program Assistant for Sustainable Energy and the Environment. Welcome to our panelists and take it away. Great. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, as Bobby said, my name is Amelia, and I am so excited to be celebrating Earth Day with all of you um, and for us to really turn this celebration into action. Hello, everyone. My name is Alicia, but you all can call me Leash. I'm so thrilled that you all showed up today and want to learn more about lobbying on carbon pricing. So carbon pricing can definitely be wonky and confusing, but I know after this hour, you will feel so confident lobbying your members of Congress. So first, Leash, I want to ask you a little bit about uh, the first Earth Day. I know many of us have our own kind of memories about Earth Day. I certainly remember kind of elementary school, middle school, going around and picking up trash uh, somewhere with my class. But can you tell us a little bit about what made the first Earth Day happen and what did it look like? Well, did you know that the first Earth Day is inherently bipartisan, making Earth Day itself inherently bipartisan because it took place under Nixon in 1970. So in the decades leading up to the first Earth Day, Americans were consuming leaded gas or massive and inefficient automobiles industries polluted without fear of consequence, and then air pollution was just commonplace. Um, and until that point, Americans remained largely oblivious to environmental concerns as a whole. So Earth Day founder, Senator Gaylord Nelson, came up with this idea for a national day to focus on the environment after he witnessed the consequences of a massive oil spill in Santa Barbara, California in 1969. So he was inspired by the student anti-war movement at the time. Senator Nelson realized that if he harnessed the energy behind the anti-war movement and transferred it to air and water pollution, it could bolster the environmental movement to the national level. And he picked April 22nd as Earth Day because it fell between spring, spring break and finals so students could participate. So on April 22nd, 1970, 20 million Americans, and that was 10% of the population at the time, that's crazy, demonstrated for a healthy, sustainable environment in a massive coast-to-coast -coast rallies, including thousands of colleges and universities. So this first, first Earth Day alone led to the creation of the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, and the passage of landmark envir legis environment legislation, such as the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and the Endangered Species Act, three huge pieces of legislation that we still depend on today and protect. Wow, thanks, Leash. So we know that FCNL has some really passionate advocates who live out the values underlying Earth Day of stewardship in so many ways. So I wonder if you could maybe highlight a few stories uh, about how climate advocacy has changed over the years. Yes, there are some great stories. So first I talked to Bob Schultz, who has been an FCNL advocate for over 30 years. It's crazy. That's older than I am. Um, and he shared with me some articles that he has written over the previous years about Earth Day. And at 84, Bob remembers the first Earth Day in 1970. And his first reflection was that 
the actions he took then seem so small compared to what needs to be done now to address climate change and stave off the worst consequences. And then I talked to former FCNL Executive Secretary Joe Boak, who told me about how the first green building on Capitol Hill came to be. Spoiler alert, it's our building. Um, his story, while entertaining in its own right and left me at the edge of my seat, and I knew what happens because we work there, um, it had a bigger message that I was not expecting. The building had an advocacy effect on the hill and beyond the hill. Joe said that once word got out what this little organization on Capitol Hill did, other renovations and building projects imagined what they could do. More than a decade later, FCNL's 245 building is a LEED certified building with a platinum rating, which is the highest rating a building can achieve. So we practice what we preach. And then I talked to a very obvious choice, FCNL's former legislative manager for sustainable energy and environment, F Emily Wurzba. And as someone who has worked in environmental advocacy for seven years, she has seen a true shift in how climate change and environmental issues are elevated by both the public and our policymakers. We have transitioned from urging members of Congress to acknowledge that climate change is real to trying to make steps towards addressing the climate crisis. Wow, thanks, Leish. That, that's, uh, those are some great stories, and I know you've got them up uh, on a blog post on our website, so I hope people will go and, and check those out. So as you said, we're in the midst of a climate crisis that has vast consequences, right? Climate change affects so many parts of our lives. It's a public health crisis, it's a human crisis, and it's a financial crisis. So this crisis is so large that the Earth Day Network dedicated this year's Earth Day to climate action. So how have you seen climate action change since you started at FCNL? Well, we have seen unprecedented climate, public climate action since I started in September. So we had the wildly successful climate strikes to youth leader Greta Thunberg fearlessly admonishing world leaders multiple times. And the public will for action is there. Because of public outcry, Congress has held more briefings, more votes, and more hearings on climate-related topics than ever before. There's an overall want for something to address the climate crisis. We want to ensure that carbon pricing is part of that something. So as of April 2020, seven carbon pricing bills have been introduced by the 116th Congress, four of which had bipartisan support. Many of these bills are actually in alignment with FCNL's carbon pricing principles, including protecting vulnerable communities. It is so incredible that we have seen almost two times as many carbon pricing bills in the 116th Congress than in the 115th Congress. It shows that our advocacy and our education on the Hill is working. That's great, um, Leash. But I, I want to bring us back to, now, we all know that right now we're in the middle of another crisis, right? We're in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, and we're, you know, FCNL, we're all working uh, remotely. We're still, you know, having those meetings with uh, members of Congress just over the phone and via Zoom. Um, and we're trying to get them to adopt policies. But I wonder, how, can, how has FCNL's climate program adapted given the COVID-19 pandemic? We're experiencing two crises at the same time. First, there's COVID-19, an immediate threat of ending lives across the world right now. But even as millions try to weather this pandemic, the impacts of climate change continue to grow. And there's one lesson we should all take from COVID-19. When Congress views an issue as a genuine threat, it will pass responses in record time. In, Mar in March, Congress passed three stimulus bills to stave off the worst economic consequences of COVID-19. And we now know that Congress can pass solutions to a global crisis, but it should not take stay at home orders and overwhelmed hospitals to convince Congress to act. We cannot wait for the climate crisis to kill thousands from air pollution or displace millions of climate, ex ugh, displace millions because of climate exacerbated, exacerbated events. And then we have a refugee crisis on our hands. Congress must address the climate crisis before we reach catastrophic consequences not after. And we need to let Congress know that we, we care, we're still here. Just because we are under stay-at-home orders does not mean we have to sit in silence. 
we can still use our voices to make change. I have lobby visits over the phone. Coalitions are meeting over Zoom. We're working to ensure that we recover from this dreadful time in a sustainable way. So as some of you might have heard, we still had our spring lobby weekend, except we just moved it to a virtual format. This past March, we had two and a half weeks to transform an in-person event into a virtual experience for young adults. But thanks to the tenacity of 500 amazing young people from 38 states, the virtual event was a huge success. We completed over 130 virtual lobby visits with congressional staffers. It is easy to be immobilized by fear and anxiety in times like these, but hundreds of young advocates decided to channel their anxiety into climate action. And I'm still following up on their lobby visits. It's just, it's incredible. Thanks, Leish. Well, and certainly thanks to you and, and everyone who was a part of Spring Lobby Weekend. That was just such a successful event, especially given everything that else has been going on. Um, I want to go further a bit into kind of what we're experiencing right now in this moment. You know, we're all kind of, um, our, our lives have changed dramatically in the midst of the COVID uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And certainly uh, we're seeing just in the midst of something so catastrophic for our society and for the entire world, um, in the midst of all of this, why is it important that we advocate for a solution to climate change right now? Well, like I said above, we're experiencing two crises at the same time, and these crises of the world are interconnected. We know, for instance, that people are col of color are disproportionately subjected to air pollution, increasing their risk of cardiovascular and respiratory disease. And we know that underlying conditions like these decrease abil the body's ability to fight COVID-19. And then, tragically, vulnerable communities are frequently situated in medically underserved areas. So when we lobby for equitable and just climate policies, it trickles down into every aspect of our lives. The climate crisis still looms as we deal with this unprecedented public health crisis. But we cannot forget the progress we have seen recently and how far we need to go. We also know that 2021 is the earliest possible window we have to actually pass meaningful climate legislation in Congress. But even then, um, we'll most likely face a divided Congress. So bipartisan support will be crucial for climate action. Therefore, we believe that right now in 2020, we is, 2020 is a critical time for climate action. What we do in 2020 will determine what is possible for 2021. So 2020 is the time to build relationships with our elected officials and educate them on why carbon pricing is the most cost efficient way to reduce our emissions at the scale and speed that is necessary. And we are supportive of a number of carbon pricing bills in Congress. We support carbon pricing as a whole. Now is the time to lift up our carbon pricing principles and urge Congress to support the strongest possible legislation, which we believe is the Climate Action Rebate Act. Wow, thanks, Leish. That is super helpful for setting the scene. I think we all have a better understanding of FDNL's work and the state of climate legislation in this very moment. Um, now let's transition into our lobby training. So we'll be taking the lead here, um, but don't worry, I'll be back shortly. All right, everyone. So now we are at the portion that you've all been waiting for. It's time for our lobby training. But first, before we get into that, I want to explain the ask, which is to co-sponsor the Climate Action Rebate Act. I will say it again. Climate Action Rebate Act, which in the House is HR 4051, and in the Senate, S2284. So the Climate Action Rebate Act is a type of carbon pricing legislation. So before we get into that, what is carbon pricing, you ask? Great question. So carbon pricing is a market-based approach to reducing our country's greenhouse gas emissions by placing a price on those emissions. Many economists agree that pricing carbon is the most cost-effective lever to reduce carbon emissions at the scale and speed that is necessary. So this is how it works. A price is set per metric ton of greenhouse gas emissions. Say, for example, $15 for a ton emitted by fossil fuel producers, like oil at the refinery, 
um, coal at the mine or natural gas when processed. Each year, the price on emissions increases. This drives down emissions and incentivizes a shift towards a clean energy economy because it'll be more expensive to use fossil fuels, making clean energy sources cheaper. A good carbon pricing bill will also set goals for how much our emissions will be reduced each year. These emission targets should be set in line with the scientific, scientific community's recommendations to avoid the catastrophic effects of climate change. Then each year, the EPA or other agency should measure how quickly the tax is actually working. We want to make sure that the carbon price will get us to that final emissions reduction goal. If emissions are not going down fast enough, the price should be increased. Now, personally, I'm a very logical, linear thinker, and I love that there are interim goals so that the tax actually works. We would never want to enact legislation that's ineffective. So this kind of policy also generates a lot of revenue and that can be used to help make the transition easier for vulnerable communities. It can be used to invest in clean energy and infrastructure or offset other taxes. We want to make it so it is more expensive to pollute. So if I had to summarize what I just said, it would be this. We want to make it more expensive to pollute. We want to incentivize a shift towards a clean energy economy and make sure vulnerable communities are helped and not harmed by a carbon tax. We are lobbying for the Climate Action Rebate Act today. So I'm going to explain the specifics of the, that bill. And of course, I'm not going to get into everything. I can't explain every revenue use, but you can always check it out online or email, or email me questions or ask questions in the chat. So this bill, the Climate Action Rebate Act, places a strong price of $15 per metric ton of greenhouse gas emissions and increases by $15 each year. So if emission reduction goals aren't met, like we discussed before, the price increases by $30 a year instead. The Climate Action Rebate Act is designed to reduce U.S. carbon emissions by 55% by 2030 and seeks to achieve 100% emissions reduction by 2050 below 2017 levels. It is designed to send a critical price signal to help us prevent temperatures from rising more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. And this is in line with what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is recommending, the IPCC is also the acronym that it used. Revenue from the bill is used for a variety of purposes. So here's the first breakdown. 70% of the money generated by the tax is distributed to low and middle income households in the form of a monthly dividend. 20% of the revenue goes to fund infrastructure, 5% funds clean energy, research development, and the remaining 5% funds transition assistance for fossil fuel workers and those disproportionately affected by high energy costs. There's also a border tax adjustment, which means that imports coming from a country without a carbon tax, a carbon price gets taxed, and American exports receive a credit. And this ensures that US goods are still cost competitive. One reason that I am so excited about this bill is that the, use, the revenue uses are used in so many ways to help protect vulnerable communities. So equity concerns are addressed through various allocations of the revenue. For example, coastal resiliency, hospital and health center climate resiliency, clean drinking water, cleanup of Superfund sites, reforestation, weatherization assistance, and financial assistance for low-income households to pay energy bills, rural flood prevention, and transition assistance for fossil fuel dependent workers. And that can include uh, wage insurance, pension and health benefits, early retirement, and job retraining. And these are just some of the many programs funded and all designed to ensure that vulnerable communities will be t protected. If you wanna learn more, you can go to fcnl.org slash carbon pricing. And there's a bill analysis of this bill and all the other ones. There's also a chart that Bobby already put in the chat. Of course, FCNL believes that carbon pricing is only one piece of the solution needed. Many more bills should be passed to fully protect communities of color and other vulnerable communities and to ensure that our economy fully decarbonizes. All right, that was a lot of information and I just talked for a long, long time straight. If you have any other questions, as I mentioned, you can either email me, drop it in the chat, 
or go to fcnl.org slash carbon pricing. Okay, deep breath. Now we're going to go on to the lobbying, the really fun part. It is obviously going to look a little different because it will be via conference call rather than in person. But I, if you walk away with one thing other than the ask, it's to know that your virtual lobbying is equally effective and important. So how does lobbying over the phone actually work? We're going to walk you through our lobby visit roadmap in just a few minutes. We're almost there. But there are a couple of important things to keep in mind when you're having your phone calls with congressional staff. So if you call in with a telephone conference line in case there's more than one of you on this call, be sure to call in 10 minutes before the call starts. You never know what could happen. Plus, a lot of businesses are using free conference lines to conduct their everyday work. So there's some backlog, your call can get dropped. That 10 minutes of buffer time really helps you ease your anxieties just in case something does happen. Plus, if nothing happens and you have this extra time, you can go through your speaking roles with each other and ensure that the lobby visit is going to go smoothly. Remember, part two, remember to speak clearly, follow the script, and relax. Congressional staffers are just people too, and you're here to tell them why you care about climate change and what you want Congress to do about it. A lot of people do this without doing a lobby training. You have this whole hour training and it's going to go fine, I promise you. The last thing I have to say is don't worry if there are problems or extra noise. We are all, and that's including congressional staff, learning how to manage in this new reality. Be kind and recognize that congressional staffers are also very stressed at this time. All right, now I want to walk us through the lobby visit roadmap. And this is to help ensure that you have a plan for your lobby meetings and know who is saying what, or if it's just you on the call, what the flow should be. First, you will introduce yourself and describe your ties to the community. So this could include your church, your clubs, your schools. You, could all, you should also ask the congressional staffer how much time they have for the call so you can calibrate your meeting flow accordingly. Say they have less time, you want to make sure that you get your questions in there like, does the member support carbon pricing? What are their climate goals for this Congress? Um, if they have longer, you can talk more about your personal experience and get a better one-on-one -on -one connection. Then say thank you. And this is critically important because it lets the office know that you're there to have a respectful dialogue and conversation with them. Giving a thank you to, a mem to the member or the staffer demonstrates that you are not simply there to yell at them. And I entered in the house while I was in college and part of my job was to answer constituent calls. And most of the time people were calling because they were not happy. And so I know that if someone called and started with a thank you, my guard would come down. I'd be so much more relaxed and ready to help them. So by showing appreciation, you're establishing credibility and setting yourself up for a productive visit. Prior to the visit, research the member's policy goals and their voting record. Find something you genuinely agree with and thank the member for their stance. The thank you does not have to be related to your ask. It could be on a completely separate issue area. And if that doesn't work, I know some of us live in districts where we just do not agree with our member. You can just thank them for taking the time to speak with you during this uncertain time. It's an easy way and it still sets up that relationship and that cred credibility. Then introduce the ask. This is where you want to clearly state what it is we're hoping the members of Congress will do, which is to co-sponsor the Climate Action Rebate Act. If they take anything away from this meeting, we want it to be this. And one thing I like to point out this, in this moment is because we're doing this over the phone, you have the luxury of just pulling up the ask on your phone, on your computer, and pulling parts from the lead behind to just read over the phone if you feel like you, can't, you don't understand or you didn't memorize it, or if you just want it as like a safety blanket. Um, that's kind of the perk of lobbying over the phone now. So after you introduce the ask, it's time for you to share your own personal stories about why they care about climate change. You might be wondering why FCNL suggests sharing stories rather than numbers and figures. So as constituent lobbyists, our stories are the power we have when we talk to a congressional office. You do not have to be an expert in the policy in order to be an infected lobbyist. Your story is uniquely yours. A staffer cannot discredit your experience 
or how you were feeling in the moment of that story. And plus, stories connect you and the staffer on a human level. The staffer can relate to what you were feeling. So your story is the answer to this question. What is mot motivating you to advocate to address climate change? So the answer could be a, a multitude of different things. And it could be a story that connects with your identity. For example, as a young person, as a student, as a Quaker or a person of faith, or as a person of color. A story that reflects the need to advocate at this moment, the urgency of this moment. We have less than 10 years to address climate change. Or it could be a story about community impact, like a hurricane or climate exacerbated event. And at the end, you need to make sure you tie it back to them co-sponsoring the Climate Action Rebate Act. So I have found, especially in preparation for Spring Lobby Weekend, that people have a hard time getting a story about climate change. And so I always joke that my first, my go-to story is my easy story because I was affected by climate change firsthand. I'm going to share it with you now. Ready? See. In hindsight, my climate change journey started amidst the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy in 2012. Hurricane Sandy blew through New Jersey, leaving destruction in her wake, including my family's house. A 100-year-old oak tree had landed squarely over my bedroom. And I will never forget the sound the tree made, leaving a massive dent in our home. Seven additional tree, down trees on our street left us stranded for, from civilization for 15 days. And we were left without power for 15 days. At the time, I did not relate this experience with climate change. I did not find it odd that exactly a year prior, we had experienced a substantial blizzard. And this was the second year in a row that Halloween was canceled due to inclement weather. I was facing the effects of climate change before I had even call it, come to call it by name. If we do not drastically reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, more climate exacerbated events will continue to ravage our state, our nation, and the world. And that is why I hope that your boss can co-sponsor the Climate Action Rebate Act of 2019 as a way to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and address climate change. And that's it. Very short, I always suggest keeping it under two minutes. Um, if you're the only one on the call, it could be a little longer, but you don't want them to zone out. Um, notice that I did not mention any numbers or figures. And I did, this, I did this on purpose to show you that you can really lobby with an emphasis on your story as opposed to anything else. This does not mean that you should not insert some of the facts and talking points I'm giving you today. Please do so if you feel so moved. But don't be nervous if you forget something. That's also why we have a lead behind with more detailed information that you can all email your congressional offices when you lobby. After your story, there's a chance to ask follow-up questions to the staffer. So you can ask, ask things like, does a member of Congress support this bill? Or carbon pricing more broadly? If not, why not? What strategy, strategies does a member support to address climate change? And does the member hear from the constituents on climate change often? These are all great questions that I ask in my own lobbying, and it, they're really helpful to get a frame of reference of where the member is on this issue. And since you'll be on the phone, remember to prompt the staffer to ask questions of you as well. Make sure you're leaving time for them to respond and be part of the discussion. And you might need to specifically ask for their opinions throughout the phone call. There isn't the same visual cues of, I am done talking, it is your turn now. Um, so when the conversation is wrapping up, Remind them of the ask one more time and then thank them for taking the time to speak with you. Let them know that you'll be following up via email to learn more about their stance on the issue. And it keeps, them, keeps you and them accountable of this conversation that you've been having. So I find it, I learn better when someone shows me how to do it. So Amelia and I are going to role play a lobby visit for you. Amelia will be Senator Booker's staff and I will be a constituent. And see. All right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let's uh, start. Go ahead, Alicia. All right. Hi, Amelia. This is Alicia Cannon. How are you doing today? Hi, Alicia. I'm doing all right. You know, things are really busy here. So we're dealing, doing a lot dealing with COVID-19 and everything's really uncertain, but um, we're adjusting, you know. Yeah, well, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today with everything going on. Um, my name is Alicia and I'm from South Brunswick, New Jersey. I'm here as a constituent of the Friends Committee on National Legislation, the Quaker Lobby, 
And I'm very active in my local church, St. Augustine's of Canterbury and Kendall Park, and I'm an avid environmentalist. Before we get started, um, how much time do you have to speak with me today? Oh, thanks for asking. You know, it's, it's crazy busy, so I've got about 15 minutes, but thank you for checking. Oh, great. Well, first, I want to thank the Senator for introducing the Environmental Justice Act of 2019, and I really appreciate his leadership on this important issue. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Yeah, Senator Booker is really passionate about supporting frontline communities. Well, the bill I'm talking about today has many provisions to protect vulnerable communities. I would like Senator Booker to co-sponsor S2284, the Climate Action Rebate Act of 2019. Now, this is a bill that would place a $15 metric ton price on carbon emissions and would rise by $15 each year. The bill would eventually get us to 55% emissions reduction by 2030 and exceeds our Paris Climate Agreement goals. And I think it is a really important bill for the center to support because my community deeply cares about climate change and we, and we don't have time to waste. Um, as a person of faith, I believe we have an obligation to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and protect God's creation. We have a climate emergency and climate change is already harming people all over the world, primarily low income communities and communities of color. People are suffering because of our inaction. The United States is the greatest historical emitter of greenhouse gases, yet the least responsible are facing the brunt of climate impacts. How is that fair or, or just? So I believe the United States has a moral obligation to address climate change. And that is why I hope your boss can co-sponsor the Climate Action Rebate Act. I'd love to hear from you, Amelia, the Senator's position on the bill. Well, thanks, Alicia. That's, that's really helpful. You know, uh, as I said, Senator Booker, he's in favor of carbon pricing, but, you know, I really don't actually know if he's signed on to other carbon pricing legislation. Well, that's interesting. Can you tell me what other environmental legislation the Senator is interested in? Well, um, as you know, the Senator thinks all Americans, it's important that they have access to clean water, clean air, and that's why he's really been a leader in developing federal policies that lift up frontline communities, which disproportionately bear the burden of environmental pollution and exploitation. Well, that is great to hear. The Climate Action Rebate Act actually has provisions for frontline communities, such as transition assistance for communities dependent on fossil fuels and funding for clean drinking water, and funding for cleanup of the Superfund sites, which you know are primarily next to low-income communities and communities of color. Well, that's great to hear. Can you send me more information on that bill? Um, you know, this has been super helpful. Unfortunately, I've got to run to a, another meeting, but really great speaking with you today. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Um, like I said, I really hope Senator Booker can co-sponsor the Climate Action Rebate Act. I'll send you an email in the next few days that has more information about our ask. And I'd love to be able to follow up with you in about a week or two to see if you had a chance to look at the bill yet. Sounds perfect. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Thanks, Amelia. <laughs> All right. Great. See? Nothing too hard or complicated. Um, hopefully that role play illustrates for you all how an effective lobby visit can go. And now I want to leave enough time for questions and answers. And I know Bobby has a, a little part for us too. But I want to leave you with some final thoughts. Members of Congress must work for and listen to their constituents. It is their job. Therefore, it is incredibly important that constituents call, write, or when we can, visit their member of Congress to make their voices known. Democracy relies on it. So furthermore, constituents can get in meetings and in offices where we cannot. They have this privilege that we can never have a chance to vote for that member in the next election cycle. So your voice is so powerful. And I just, I, I, when I do these trainings for others, people forget that they have this like power in them. My second point is that climate change as an issue can be really overwhelming and incredibly scary. There've been a lot of articles about climate anxiety and we, we can recycle, be environmentally aware, I mean, vegan, but it can still feel inadequate compared to the magnitude of the issue. Lobbying the United States government on climate change can help individuals feel like they are doing their civic duty and making a tangible difference. And lastly, the Young Adults from Swing Lobby Weekend prove that lobbying can be just as effective virtually. They, they definitely set a really high bar but it proves that your lobbying can make a difference too. It can be just as powerful as an in-person event. 
And we can join them. We can join this high bar that they set by writing, calling your a member of Congress. Thanks. And I think that concludes our Earth Day 2020 lobby training on carbon pricing. I'd like to extend a huge thank you to our wonderful panelists for sharing their expertise with us during this time, but the excitement isn't over yet. Our website is filled with a number of additional resources and tools for taking action on, climate ch on the climate emergency through carbon pricing legislation. I'm going to share my screen really quick and uh, take you on a brief tour of our website and show you some of these tools and resources, and then we'll use any remaining time to address questions from the audience. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, um, so I'm gonna start just at my browser window and I'm gonna type in fcnl.org. Is everyone seeing this? Let me try that one more time. There we go. Um, uh, sorry, I'm going to go to fcnl.org slash climate. That'll take us to our climate page. Um, this page is sort of a clearinghouse of different resources that I mentioned earlier. The first thing I want to show you, though, is our monthly newsletter, Inside the Greenhouse, which is a set of updates um, that, uh, from the environmental policy world written by our own Alicia Cannon, who's a panelist with us today. Um, you can sign up to receive this in your email inbox every month right here at the bottom. All right, the next thing I want to show you on our climate page is this action alert. This tool um, will connect you directly with your members of Congress and you can contact them about carbon pricing. So I'm going to click on that. And that's going to take me to FCNL's brand new action center. Um, and here we have uh, a form email template that FCNL has prepared for constituents to modify just a little bit because we know from research done by the Congressional Management Foundation that the more you personalize a form email like this, the more impact it actually has. So I'm going to personalize this just a little bit by changing the subject line. Same message, but my own words. Climate change is threatening my community. Please support carbon pricing legislation to mitigate the climate emergency. And then I'm just going to paste in a paragraph that I prepared using my own story, my own experience uh, being impacted by climate change uh, since I grew up in Northern California and wildfires were a really big part of my experience growing up. So I use that as my personal experience with climate change to really show the human face of why this issue is so important to me. And then I'm ready to hit submit, and that'll send it off to my DC representative, Representative Norton, but for you, based on whatever address you put in at the beginning, uh, it'll send it to your representatives. All right, and the last thing I want to show everyone is um, our new guide to virtual lobbying, which you can find at fcnl.org slash act local. This is just a very brief guide um, that summarizes some of the points that Alicia and Amelia made today on how to prepare and gather for your virtual lobby visit and how to plan and actually conduct your lobby visit. And we have a number of additional resources down here on this page, like the lobby visit roadmap that Alicia walked us through so expertly during this lobby training. Um, our links to a number of our lobby asks on the different issues we work on, a link to our lobby report back form, which you can use to let us know how your meetings went, and finally a follow-up email template that you can use to stay in touch with the office you lobbied. And uh, if you liked what you heard in this lobby training today and you're ready to take your next advocacy steps and go on a virtual lobby visit, you can fill out this survey page called I'm Ready to Virtually Lobby and uh, an SCNL staff lobby trainer will be in touch with you shortly to help you prepare for your lobby visits. And uh, I think with that, we have time for some questions from the audience. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and invite our panelists uh, back on to answer some questions. All right, I've been reading some of the questions and I'm starting from this first one that I think is really interesting. So, uh, and if I mispronounce your name, I'm so sorry. 
Um, Elaine Emmy asks, how can we reverse what the president is doing by removing environmental regulations? That is so important because it's something that I don't think the everyday person realizes that is happening, that there's been so many environmental regulatory rollbacks under the Trump administration that undermines a lot of the work that we're doing. So how can we reverse what the president's doing? I don't, us on this call, I don't know how we could do it. However, one of the biggest things that you can do is educate everyone on this issue that the um, inefficient light bulbs, the car efficiency standards, methane regulations, and most recently this mercury, mercury regulatory rollback, all of them are just chipping away at these really important environmental regulations that we have in place under the EPA. And the Trump administration is doing this during the pandemic because they're coming up on a very important deadline. Um, so I think the best thing you can do right now is share, I personally use the New York Times articles to educate myself on these regulatory rollbacks for the everyday brain. Um, and if you can share those, let everyone know that this is happening. That's the best thing you can do. I know there are some letters going around the Senate um, from Senate Democrats who are expressing their concern over the, the constant chipping way environmental regulations. Um, so you can email, tweet, um, and if you want to set up a call, you can set up a call with your member of Congress about how you are concerned about the, the Trump administration removing environmental regulations. That's a valid thing to lobby on too, and incredibly important. Um, so. I yeah, and if I could just add on um, leash there, I think there are a couple other things to kind of take note. Oftentimes when um, the administration proposes regulations, there is a comment period. So um, you can go in and actually submit a comment about uh, your opposition to rolling back some of these regulations and FCNL in a number of different areas, um, not just in the environmental space, but has been submitting comments um, opposing many of the uh, regulatory rollbacks and different uh, proposed rules that the administration has sent out. So that's a, another option. Um, and oftentimes, it, even if it doesn't uh, convince the agency to kind of uh, to roll back or to, to uh, repeal this effort to do a uh, proposed rule or to roll back some of uh, the, the regulations, it oftentimes can set up a uh, uh, for litigation that may be happening later on. So that's kind of been one of FCNL strategies since we don't actually litigate, but sometimes we can, that can be supportive from, for upcoming uh, litigation. I would say the other thing that I think this shows is just um, that elections matter, right? And who is in office and what administration is in office, that matters and has enormous consequences. And so I would say it's really important for you to kind of, as Leish was saying, educate your community, get people um, registered to vote and just doing that uh, effort of really engaging candidates and others that you believe that this is an, an important issue and, and really help mobilize uh, voter turnout uh, for the for the election. So that's the other piece of that that I think we can't lose sight of and remember that that um, who's in office and, and what their priorities are, are very much shaped by how we engage in the campaign process and um, and how the, the the results of those elections turn out. So I would I would also mention that. That is very true, um, so true. Anna Coster asks, will there be a comparison analysis here of the many carbon pricing bills now in Congress, and what are the chances of getting any of them passed before the bills expire? So to your first question. We have a carbon pricing comparison chart on our website at fcnl.org slash carbon pricing. It's a very handy chart and we have found that staffers really like in love this chart and we give them a hard copy and sometimes an email for an electronic copy. Um, it's a great comparison analysis because it's the same questions and all the different answers. Um, I suggest when you send the follow-up email that you include this chart in the email because like I said, we are advocating for this one bill, but we advocate for carbon pricing in general. If another carbon pricing bill comes up that's moving, we'll support it. Um, so look for that chart, it's great. And then what are the chances of getting any of them passed before the bills expire? So as I mentioned um, with Amelia earlier, we know that we're in an election year and now we have a pandemic. Congress is not going to be doing a lot of legislating. Um, 
So we know realistically that the first chance to pass meaningful climate legislation is in 2021. Um, and that being said, with a whole new Congress, the authors of the bills will reintroduce these carbon pricing bills. Um, a lot of well, all of these bills have sciences based on like certain enactment dates. And when they reintroduce these bills, they update the, the, the numbers um, to ensure that we will reach like a, a zero emissions by 2050. Um, so just because there are seven this Congress doesn't mean we have to like start over in the next Congress. Maybe we'll get some more options, which would be really cool. Yeah, and I'll just add that oftentimes um, when the lead sponsor reintroduce their bills in a subsequent Congress, uh, they first go back to those uh, members who have already, who co-sponsored in the last version. And it's much easier than they just usually pretty quickly sign on again because the legislation hasn't, hasn't really changed much. Sometimes it gets tweaked a little. But, um, so that's why it's not like all the work that you is lost come a new Congress, it actually helps propel the conversation and the support of that legislation further um, when a new Congress begins. Great. Um, Shannon Lynch um, asks a great question that I get a lot. I live in Washington, D.C., so I do not have a voting member of Congress. How might I be able to most effectively lobby the D.C. Council or the mayor? Um, first, the same skills apply. Um, they, these people work for you and if you contact them, they will send a staffer or some, some constituent outreach person to listen to your concerns, take notes and take it to their boss. So you can still enact change. You can still urge them to address climate change in a different way. It might not be a, a DC wide carbon tax, um, but even if you just go in with the premise of, I am concerned about climate change, what are you doing? to ensure that DC is doing their part. Um, you're in doing the good, you're helping um, contribute to the whole movement. Another point I'd like to bring up, as a DC resident, um, you can lobby in the place you used to live. So I talked to, I'm from New Jersey, um, and I have lobbied my previous member of Congress because my parents still live there. I lobbied on behalf of there and I still have those community ties I was talking about. When you talk about your community, like my church back in South Brunswick, New Jersey, I still talk to them and they still know my concerns about climate change. And when you come into the office, they know that you're going to talk to your community about what happened on, in this visit. Um, so don't be afraid to use those ties. Um, I know my former boss, Emily, she was from North Carolina and she would also urge her parents and her sisters and cousins back home to lobby in that district. So don't be afraid of like tapping into your connections. You can lobby your friends to lobby. It's, it can all work. Yeah, I think that last point is a great one, Leash. You know, we all have relationships and connections and family members all over the country who live in some very important states when it comes to this issue. And so, your ability to kind of uh, talk with and encourage uh, some of your other family members or friends to also contact their uh, legislators on this is important. And you just saw how incredibly easy this can be, right? Um, so we hope that you'll be sharing those resources with others that you that you know. Um, yes. All right. So Priscilla Preston, beautiful name asks, how did FCNL determine that a carbon tax is the most effective action to take now? And I love how you phrase this question, Priscilla, because the end is most important, the most effective action to take now. Um, so FCNL determined that a carbon tax is the most effective way to address climate change right now because, because we support bipartisan legislation that is moving in Congress. And as I said, carbon pricing ha has four bipartisan bills in Congress right now. And that's incredible. We're going from a point in time when Republicans did not even talk about climate change. It was almost like a tainted good to the fact that they are writing their own carbon pricing bills and having their own solutions come in. And so that is why we support a carbon tax as the one of many solutions that is needed to address climate change. Now, if we see that something else is moving and is an effective vehicle to address climate change, we can change our support or support both. It's not a mutually exclusive thing. 
Um, that is one thing. And also I saw another question later on that says, uh, one second, that, ooh, I don't have the question exactly, but basically someone asked, I, I thought FCNL didn't support one specific bill. I thought FCNL supports carbon pricing as a whole. And you're correct. Um, before spring lobby weekend, it's still on our website now, it says that we have not endorsed a specific bill. We advocate for carbon pricing as, a, as an idea, and we still do. We, we would never say that we would never badmouth another car carbon pricing bill. We are here to support the idea. But for Spring Lobby Weekend, it was easier to teach 500 young adults how to lobby on, the, on one bill than to give them the big comparison chart and send them on their way with a very wonky subject. Um, plus, because we know that carbon pricing is not moving in this Congress, we wanted to um, advocate for the bill that embodied our carbon pricing principles the most. And that was the Climate Action Rebate Act because of its so many provisions for protecting vulnerable communities. And also uh, something important to us is that it does not over, um, roll back EPA authority. Um, again, that being said, if a carbon price is moving, we will, we will support it and we will go lobby on it. So I hope that yeah, answers your questions. Yeah, and I, just to add on to that, I think, you know, we always see this in legislation, right? When you're, when they're, they're builds an agreement that action needs to be taken to address an issue, right? And so we're building up that bipartisan support. But when we come out and we're saying, this is one of, this is how we think a carbon, a price on carbon should be structured. We want to start out by saying, by going with what we think is the best option. And then as momentum builds and you start seeing those negotiations move forward and there's um, movement in Congress, then we start to see compromises be being made and that sort of stuff. But we wanna start out with our principles and supporting kind of the legislation that we think is most effective. So as Leish said, that's why we're kind of holding up the legislation that we're holding up while still saying, listen, well, we support uh, all of these different um, carbon pricing bills and would like would be happy to see any of them enacted. So that's kind of what our position is on that. Thanks, Amelia. That was incredibly well said. Um, so another question from Priscilla that I think is really important. Um, what is the most memorable story you've heard? Um, and I'm also going to tie it into another thing. Trying to get an idea of what, the idea about what kind of story is effective. Um, so I don't think first that they're like ineff ineffective and effective stories. Like they all are your, are your story and they're going to tell your connection to the issue. Um, I think one of the most memorable stories I've heard was this, I had a, a, a person from Ellicott City, Maryland, um, where they had two 1,000 year floods in two years. So they rebuilt after the first year, 1,000 year flood, thinking this could never happen again. This insane rainfall would never plague this town again. So they rebuilt this beautiful city. It, I saw pictures, it's very quaint and like had family run stores and people put their life savings into it. And then less than two years later, they had another thousand year st storm that flooded the town and this had never happened. And people were left deflated and defeated and they don't know what to do. They don't know how to plan their city. They don't know what kind of construction projects or resiliency plans they should have in place. Everyone's arguing over what is the best, best thing to do. But this person just wanted the federal government to acknowledge that this is happening and people are suffering and that these climate exacerbated events are not just happening over there is what I like to say, like in the Pacific Ocean where islands are sinking. That doesn't affect me. I don't see that every day. But for her, this was happening in her town in Maryland, not far from DC. Um, so that was, I was so, so moved from that story. There's a lot of articles online about this city, if you want to look into it. Um, that was very moving. But one story I like to tell, I'm so sorry to people on the call who hear this all the time. Um, I had a group of 30 middle schoolers lobby their member of Congress from Virginia and it did not go to plan. The member of Congress could not come because of votes being delayed. Um, and so the kids were defeated. 
they still got to lobby the environmental staffer and they had handwritten letters to give to the, the member of Congress that she promised to pass along to him. Um, and we left, I kind of had to cheer the kids up because they were so excited to meet their member. Um, and we were hoping that at some point he could meet them. And it was kind of an, almost an empty promise. But then two days later, the member of Congress did what the kids asked them to do, which is to join the Climate Solutions Caucus. And long story short, he ended up visiting them at their school too and answering all of their climate questions. Um, so I always love telling that story because people are always think, well, I can't lobby, I don't know enough, or this is scary, or sometimes we get like the deer in headlights because like it's Congress. Um, but it's, it's not, they're here to serve you. And if 30, 12 year olds can move their member of Congress to do something, you guys definitely can. They didn't join this call, they just had an hour of me talking. Um, so remember that you've got this and even virtually you still can do this and have an effective lobby visit. I love that story, Leash, and I think um, it is a real testament to the, the power of, um, of kind of lobbying and, and how effective that can be no matter what your age or, or anything. I, you know, just to add on, I, I think there are two things that I would say are, can be really particularly effective when you're thinking about your story. And, and it really comes down to, you are a constituent in the community of which that Senator or um, representative represents, right? So you know what that district looks like, you know the different industries. And so a lot of what's going to be most um, persuasive to a particular member is based on what the community looks like and what the community needs are. So if you're in an agriculture heavy district, maybe that sort of lens of through how climate change is affecting car, uh, farming and farming communities. You know, so thinking about those sorts of things, uh, I, I think can be helpful uh, in terms of how you're shaping or thinking about your story. And of course, because you're in your local community, you're in the best position to talk about that. I think the other thing that is really kind of persuasive is less about the actual story and more about the fact that you are a voter and you talk to other voters, right? That is, members of Congress, oftentimes, usually their number one priority is getting reelected. And so the fact that you talk about the relationships and how you're the organizing or the work that you're doing or how you're engaged in your community and talking with other voters about this is an important thing to mention. So those are the two points that I would just add on to what we just said. All right, we have time for one last question before we wrap up. And Kathy asks, uh, what are the main reasons carbon pricing might not be supported in Congress? And I think this is a great question. And it kind of plays into how you can spin carbon pricing or climate change legislation to fit the needs of your district. Um, so carbon pricing might not be supported in Congress for two main reasons. Um, for the farther the right side, some things we hear a lot is that they don't want something that destroys the economy. Well, it has been proven by many economists, in fact, 27 Nobel Prize winning economists, that carbon pricing would not ruin the economy is actually the best way to address climate change. And you can play on that market-based approach lens when you're dealing with that. We actually had a, a, a panel at Swing Lobby Weekend that was called the conservative, the conservative side of carbon pricing. Anyway, I forget the name, but you can find it online and it gives you some great talking points to talking to conservatives about carbon pricing. And then another thing we hear is that it doesn't, carbon pricing might not do enough. It doesn't go far enough. And that's why we say that carbon pricing is one tool in a huge toolbox needed to address climate change. It is not the silver bullet. We are not saying that climate change, uh, carbon pricing is the thing to solve climate change. We just think it is the first step that Congress can take to start reducing our greenhouse gas, gas emissions and make a massive dent in a journey that we have to take. Plus there are the other policies to address equity concerns and protect frontline communities, communities of color, low income communities. So those are some things that we hear on the Hill. Um, and before we end, I just wanna say thank you so much for joining from me, from Amelia, I know. Um, and thank you for taking the time and spending Earth Day with us. Yeah, wow, uh, this has been such a great hour and I've been so pleased to be able to host it and spend this time with you both. 
Huge thank you to Alicia and Amelia for this informative session and a huge thank you to our audience out there for participating with such energy and excitement. Remember, the climate crisis can't wait and together we can make change to restore the earth. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time.